Warm greetings to one and all. C3S is pleased to launch its podcast initiative, a series of recorded digital audio files that a listener can stream or download. It has hosts engaging in a dialogue on a topic relating to China with precedence to issues of interest to India. The country that we will be talking about today is the Republic of Mauritius, an island nation in the Indian Ocean region. Mauritius is garnering more attention in the international system in recent years owing to the various factors and developments that have come about in the island nation. First of which is the Maritime Law Tribunal of the United Nations ruling in favour of Mauritius concerning the sovereignty over the Chagos Archipelago. Another is the strengthening of economic and trade ties through the free trade agreement with China that came into effect in 2021. We will also be looking at the socio-cultural linkages between India and Mauritius to better understand how these two countries can augment their bilateral relations in the present and in the future. This noteworthy country is becoming a significant player in the regional and global arena. To understand her interests and the interests of those countries that have relations with her has become the need of the hour to fully envision the geopolitical dynamics in the Indian Ocean region. Now, without any further delay, let's get right into the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for listening in. This is Aishwarya S. Menon, Research Officer at the Chennai Center for China Studies, and I welcome you all to the C3S podcast on the topic, Island Diplomacy, India's Engagement with Mauritius, and the China Factor. To talk to us about this topic, we have Mr. Tanvir J. Kishan, Head, New Business Ventures, Chennai Free Trade Zone. I am delighted to introduce to you all Mr. Tanvir, who is a consultant with over five years of experience working in healthcare and life sciences consulting. He currently works as the Chief Operations Officer in Red Kangaroo Health Private Limited in Mauritius. Mr. Tanvir holds a master's degree in international health policy from the London School of Economics, and his passions are the study of geopolitics and the classical antiquities. He is a regular contributor to and a member of the Chennai Center for China Studies, and he is also a member of the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London. Welcome, Mr. Tanvir, to this C3S podcast initiative, and we look forward to listening to your thoughts and opinions and receiving first-hand information and knowledge about the island nation uh, during the course of this podcast. I welcome you once again, Mr. Tanvir Jaikishan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aishwarya. Happy to be here and a warm welcome to everybody who's listening in uh, from the Chennai Center for China Studies and uh, friends and family from as well. Uh, just a bit about Mauritius before we uh, go into the podcast. So Mauritius is a small island in the Indian Ocean uh, off the coast of Africa with a population of about 1.3 million people. And... Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, by and large, Mauritius is one of the few countries in the world today that is COVID free. Uh, I've been in, I've been living and working in Mauritius since 2017. And uh, I landed last in Mauritius from the, a business trip abroad in February of 2020. This was just before uh, the lockdown. And I've been, uh, I would say stranded here, but stranded is a bad word, but I've been here uh, a year now without moving out and um, uh, but due to strict quarantine measures uh, that has been put in place uh, the last domestic case, domestic case of covid that we had in mauritius was in uh, april of 2020 and we came out of lockdown in the middle of june and because of the two week mandatory quarantines in place for travelers coming to mauritius we have had no domestic cases of Mauritius of covid in mauritius since that time and we are by and large COVID free uh, and, and trying to sort of recover the economy. And uh, obviously, because of these quarantines, tourism has been impacted, affecting 20 percent of the GDP. But this is something that we will go into uh, in the podcast. But yes, to anybody listening, if you want to come and live in a happy COVID free country, uh, Mauritius is the place. So with that, I turn it over back to you, Aishwarya, and we can begin. Okay, sir. So thank you so much for that introduction and that overview on uh, Mauritius. And um, just to start off, um, 
we see Mauritius in the news uh, very often nowadays, and uh, this is particularly with um, the free trade agreement that was signed uh, with China that just came into effect this year or 2021. Now, in relation to this, uh, my first question to you is, uh, why is Mauritius China's first pick out of all the African countries to sign an FTA with? And what do these two countries seek to benefit from each other apart from deepening of economic uh, and trade ties? Um, and so who do you think will benefit more out of this FTA? And why hasn't India made plans towards establishing uh, an FTA with Mauritius before the Chinese showed their economic interest in the island? Right. That's a good question. And there's a lot to unpack here. Before we look at why China and Mauritius uh, have entered into this FTA, let's look at where things stand vis-a-vis trade between these two countries. Now, Mauritius exports goods uh, to China uh, with a value of close to 1 billion, that billion with a B, Mauritian rupees. Whereas Mauritius imports goods from China valued at uh, around 30 billion, that is billion with a B, Mauritian rupees. Now, just for the listeners in India, one Mauritian rupee is equal to 1.85 or 2 Indian rupees. And if you move around the zeros, you'd be able to convert your lakhs and crores into millions and billions. So, um, as I said earlier, Mauritius exports 1 billion rupees worth of goods and imports 30 billion rupees worth of goods. So, the ratio is for every 1 rupee they earn in exports, they spend 30 rupees in imports. Now, when I've actually sat down with representatives of the uh, Manufacturing Association of Mauritius and we talk about trade with India and with China, uh, what I've heard is that, look, it is very difficult to close this trade deficit between Mauritius and China simply because in Mauritius, the cost of manufacturing, the cost of labor is very high. So that prevents uh, Mauritius from actually manufacturing goods at scale and at cost to be compared to, to, to uh, for, for the Chinese domestic market to find competitive, which is why there's this huge trade deficit. And there is no scope in the future uh, to actually reduce these trade def- uh, this trade deficit between these two countries, right? So why has Mauritius and China entered into a trade agreement? Well, first of all, to answer your, the first part of the, your question, why did China sign up Mauritius is the first African country. See, the relationship between China and Mauritius go way back. Uh, Mauritius was the first African country to give Beijing diplomatic uh, recognition in 1972, right? And uh, Mauritius was one of the first African countries to host a fully-fledged embassy of China once that diplomatic recognition was given. And there is a small, I would say, a 0.5 to 1% uh, Chinese origin population here or Chinese Mauritian population here who are extremely entrepreneurial, extremely hardworking, have deep uh, roots to China and, and, and deep roots to their Chinese culture and heritage. And generally, Mauritius is considered a stable African economy, a stable democracy, a good place to do business, which is why China found in Mauritius a natural partner to sign an FTA. Now, what does this FTA mean for Mauritius? Right now, and, and, and here I'm quoting from the Economic Development Board. Uh, which actually put out a lovely press release when the FTA was signed. They said, look, um, with this FTA, we, the Mauritian government expo- expects tariffs to, on 7,500, uh, what do you say, products to be removed immediately, with another 723 additional tariff products to be phased out within the next five to seven years. And this is important, right? Because if you think about Mauritius's biggest export, it's sugar. It's sugar and it's sh- and it's rum and it's sugar derivatives. And Mauritius exports sugar all over the world, to Europe, to, to China. So uh, a part of this free trade agreement is that um, uh, there will be a, co- a rate quota or a tariff rate quota implemented uh, over the next eight years on sugar, starting with 15,000 tons of sugar going up all the way to 50,000 tons of sugar by eighth year. So this is important to be able to sell more Mauritian sugar in Chinese markets. The, even the Economic Development Board understands that ultimately this FTA, while making the Chinese market more accessible, is not going to really widen or sort of narrow this trade deficit that already exists, this 30 to 1 trade deficit. 
So what it says is what what they're really looking at is not so much products but services. Um, what Mauritius is expects from China is greater investment across multiple sectors, which is communication, education, finance, tourism, culture, and transport. And these are the sectors that they have identified and named. So what they're looking at is for Chinese companies to actually come into Mauritius and help boost these sec sectors with Chinese know-how and financing. And this free trade agreement paves the way to, to be able to do that. So really, I think the benefit is not so much for China because there is not a lot of goods that is coming in from Mauritius that the Chinese really require. And what the Chinese Manufacturing Association has also said is that, look, there are some products that we make that the Chinese also make, like garments and textiles, but the Chinese are able to do it better and cheaper and at scale, which is why not only is the Chinese domestic market not interested, but when we try to compete with the Chinese manufacturers around the world, Chinese products are anyway given a, a preference because of their cost and, and, and scalability. So in that sense, what uh, I would say that this deal would benefit Mauritius more simply because it allows for greater Chinese investment and transfer of technology and transfer of knowledge over the island in the coming uh, days, months, weeks and years. Just to give you a little context, if you compare it with India, um, India Ch Mauritius's exports to India was about 848 million rupees which is million with an m but again india's exports to mauritius was 25 billion rupees with a b so there is a trade deficit again of 30 to 1 so interestingly that the trade deficit that um, uh, mauritius has with china is the same as the trade deficit that mauritius has with india now as to why india has not moved towards signing an fta well that is something i believe that uh, the mandarins in south block would be better uh, informed to answer but i but as we go into this podcast you will see that india has inf invested very heavily in mauritius in terms of infrastructure development and 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 and, and goodwill and, and vaccine diplomacy and so on and so forth i and, and i trust that that answers your first question yes it certainly does and um, just to dig a little deeper from the points that you mentioned uh, sir uh, one can't help but wonder, you know, is there a possibility that with time Mauritius could fall prey to China's debt trap diplomacy, as in the case of, uh, let's say, Tonga or even Sri Lanka for that matter? What's your take on this, sir? Okay, see, there's a lot to talk about again, unpack here. But uh, um, see, let's talk about now is a good time to talk about the relationship between India and Mauritius and what India has done for Mauritius before, and then we talk about. Chinese investment in Mauritius and, and then I will go on to explain why getting trapped in debt diplomacy is not a possibility for Mauritius. See, now in India and Mauritius had a very uh, a sort of a successful uh, double taxation avoidance agreement that they signed, that both countries signed. In 2016, what um, India did was it sat down with Mauritius and renegotiated the agreement. Basically, what it said was, look, if you have a company in you, if, if there are companies in India that have a parent company in Mauritius, what typically happens is any revenue earned by the Indian entities was being transferred to Mauritius. The corporate tax was being paid in Mauritius at a very sort of minimal, negligible amount. And then this money was bought back into India. So that's called round tripping, right? And uh, this is why Mauritius was India's largest uh, source of FDI. It's not really Mauritius investing into India. It's India investing into India through Mauritius, paying a lower corporate tax rate. So what the government did in 2016 was they said, look, from 2017 onwards, irrespective of whether the fact that uh, India, uh, uh, whether the parent company is in Mauritius uh, and the subsidiaries in India, any income that a company makes in India has to be taxed in India at the full corporate rate. And this deal obviously did not go down so well with the Mauritian government because India was a huge source of uh, revenue uh, uh, to Mauritius. But the relationship is, is sort of so much more than uh, just the double taxation avoidance agreement. India has invested quite significantly um, in Mauritius over the last several years, right, if you think about that. So what, what India has done is we have um, actually uh, invested very heavily in infrastructure. Uh, a, a, a Supreme Court, the new the Mauritius Supreme Court building that was inaugurated this year was constructed with Indian help and Indian money. Uh, the current COVID hospital in Mauritius, which is the ENT hospital, it is a dedicated COVID facility in Mauritius, 
was built with Indian money and know-how. Um, India has contributed over the years uh, a lot of funds and lines of credit for building of roads and highways and other infrastructure projects. Uh, India is currently helping Mauritius construct a cancer hospital uh, with the country's first linear accelerator, which is huge because the country needs a linear accelerator and uh, uh, India has actually reached out and is helping Mauritius construct a cancer hospital, a dedicated uh, hospital for oncology. And the biggest deal, I think, between India and Mauritius is the metro deal, where India has agreed to fund the construction of the Mauritius metro with the Larsen and Tubro as the uh, uh, vendor for the construction. Interestingly, this deal has actually come into a bit of uh, scandal here because it's a deal between the government of India and the government of Mauritius. So the opposition in, in the Mauritian parliament has asked the government of Mauritius to release the contract. And the government says, no, we won't release the contract. And they say, no, 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 this is a GOI to GOM deal. Why aren't you releasing the contract? But this little scandal aside, India is a huge part. Or India has always been a huge sort of uh, an important part of the Mauritius. When the MV Vakashio oil spill took place, it was the Indian Navy who came in and helped clean up the spill and helped tow the boat to be cut up and destroyed. So there's a lot that India has been doing over the years, um, um, uh, you know, Aishwarya, in, in sort of... Uh, helping Mauritius become the country it is today. In fact, the, in Cyber City, where my office is, the first building that came up, the Cyber One building, came up uh, because of funding by the, the first NDA government, the Atal Bihari Vajpayee government, which is why when Mr. Vajpayee died, the building was renamed the Atal Bihari Vajpayee building. And uh, there's also a lot of temple diplomacy, right? There's also a lot of religious diplomacy where uh, the RSS and a lot of the sort of... Uh, 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 Hindu religious organizations contribute very heavily to building of temples and other religious sites and prayer halls and so on and so forth. Now, let's compare that with for a minute with the Chinese inf investment in Mauritius. The Chinese investment in Mauritius has been in uh, fits and starts and it's not really gotten off the ground, right? Um, in 2006, the Chinese government, uh, I think under Hu Jintao and, and the Mauritian government agreed to construct a 200 and sorry, uh, construct a, uh, a free trade zone in Mauritius in an area called uh, Rishter, and it was supposed to be called the Rishter Free Trade Zone. The government of Mauritius in invested about 525 million Mauritian rupees to actually prepare the zone for development. They resettled about 200 uh, sugarcane uh, and uh, plantation workers from the site because they were going to convert it into a free trade zone. But what then happened was uh, uh, the a financial crisis came in 2008 and that project was abandoned. So right now it's just empty land. I've actually driven past it a lot and, and it's, it's not really, nothing has moved on it. Uh, the Chinese government and the Mauritian government tried again, right? And they said that they were going to build a uh, another zone, another special economic zone called the Jinfei economic zone. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, I might be pronouncing this wrong. So apologies to native uh, Chinese speakers if I'm pronouncing it wrong. So they wanted to set up the Jinfei Economic Trade and Cooperation Zone. Uh, what they said was, look, it would bring, it would cost about five, uh, 500 million Mauritian rupees in, in, in development. It would create 30,000 jobs. It, it would bring in 150 million in export earnings conservatively to, to begin with. And uh, uh, right now, that deal, and this was something that they had announced in 2015, 2016, and the government again allocated land for this development of the special economic zone. But at, as of this point, it's in complete limbo. Uh, the only thing that exists there is a hotel, a conference center, and a wedding hall. In fact, um, the Mauritian government uh, has actually taken back 80% of the land that it allocated for this Jinfei economic trade zone. And the then finance minister, uh, Vishnu Lakshmi Narayanu, he said uh, very uh, sarcastically that the Jinfei is only good land for dogs to get married. Right. So um, and with that, uh, eight, the Mauritian government took back 80 percent of the land. So obviously uh, uh, there have been two attempts to create these giant sort of free trade zones and special economic zones between these two countries. They're not materialized. And while Mauritius was very keen to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative, please understand that Mauritius is not a viable uh, a location for infrastructure development to China. If you think about it, why is that? Because, see, Mauritius is too far away from Africa. It is almost but it is a great distance from Africa. There are no natural resources. Uh, the cost of manufacturing, the cost of labor is high. 
and it is better to deal with Mauritius from a services sector point of view and use Mauritius as a hub to bring in Chinese services to Africa than it is to actually bring in infrastructure. And I think where the Chinese have seeded is in the private sector because Huawei and HK Vision have made significant inroads into Mauritius. A lot of government contracts in technology is routinely given out to Huawei. Uh, HK Vision has won contracts to provide uh, what to say uh, uh, a CCTV camera coverage across the island of Mauritius, you know, for uh, looking at license plates, for thermal imaging, face recognition, etc., etc. So I would say that the private companies have done a whole lot better uh, than the public, uh, than the Chinese government can actually make inroads into Mauritius. And any attempt by the Chinese government thus far to do something big on an infrastructure scale has sort of uh, failed thus far. And uh, also bear in mind, Aishwarya, is that post-pandemic, uh, Mauritius has shut its borders, as I mentioned earlier, and that's affected tourism, which is 20% of the GDP. Mauritius does not really have the, uh, the purse strings, right, to, the ability to open up its purse strings to enter into big ticket infrastructure projects at this time. So uh, any proposal by the Chinese government to try and maybe reinvigorate the special economic zone or to start up a new project will find heavy skepticism from Mauritius because they've already been burned twice. And right now they frankly don't have the money to be doing something on a huge scale. So in my mind, to answer the question, I don't really believe that Mauritius is susceptible to, de to debt diplomacy. And I, and I also, and as we go to this podcast, you will understand the close up cultural links between India and Mauritius and why Mauritius is a more naturally aligned partner uh, with India than with China. Yes, sir. some very, very interesting and relevant points brought out by you just there. Um, so the Indian Ocean region is uh, gaining a lot of global attention now that the United Nations International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has confirmed uh, the ICJ's ruling uh, and ordered Britain to hand over the Chagos um, archipelago to Mauritius. So now with this verdict favoring Mauritius, um, in your opinion, sir, how would the dynamics between uh, the countries pertaining to geostrategy in the Indian Ocean region, uh, how, so how do you think that will play out in the years to come? See, this is, okay, I'll give you, and I'll start this with a funny anecdote. This was May of last year, and we were all still stuck in lockdown. And the last domestic cases of COVID was reported at the end of April. So it was around the middle of May, or I think end of May, where we were wondering when we were going to be let out of lockdown. There were no new cases. We were wondering why we were being cooped in our homes. And then one fine evening, we got an announcement. The prime minister is making an urgent announcement of the utmost natu national importance. And we thought, okay, finally, he's going to let us out. We were all so happy. And he comes on uh, TV and says, you know, I announce with great pride that the UN is, the United Nations has unveiled its map of the world. And it has classified the Chagos Islands as Mauritian. And this is huge implications. And he was very happy announcing that. And the Mauritians who read this and heard this were very happy. But that's not going to affect any reality on the ground. Uh, the UK and the US are not going to hand over Diego Garcia to the back to Mauritius. It's a very strategic naval base in the Indian Ocean region uh, for these countries. And I don't see any handover that's going to take place uh, in the immediate future or in the in near future and in the far future for that matter. Now, what does that have, uh, what implications does that have for a country like India, right? Especially the Aglega base that India is developing in, in Mauritius. See, uh, again, last year, I think this must have been September or October or November, I'm not sure, sometime uh, in the last quarter of last year, uh, I, I was made aware that a charter flight of 70 engineers were actually flown in from India to uh, Mauritius to begin or to continue work or construction work on Aglega. And, and uh, 14 of those engineers tested COVID positive in quarantine. So that's how I knew that Agle the work in Aglega is still sort of happening. Now, um, obviously, the, the Mauritians that I speak to are not very happy about this because when they talk about Aglega, they say, hey, this is just shagos all over again, right? I mean, uh, when we were ruled by the British, we didn't, we didn't have a say. Our sovereignty was impinged on. And uh, we lost Diego Garcia. Now we're giving up our sovereignty once again with Aglega to India and, and, and we don't want to be part of this, you know, geostrategic 
great game in the Indian Ocean region between India and China. And I always tell them, I say, hey, look, you're too important a country. You're too important uh, geostrategically speaking. If it's not India, it's going to be China, right? So the question is, who do you want on your side? Do you want the Indians on your side or do you want the Chinese on your side? And and because and, and, and the average Mauritian is, is well educated. He and she is aware of uh, China's debt diplomacy, right? So they understand that uh, they don't have they don't really have a choice. They understand that they've taken a lot of Indian money. They understand fundamentally that there is no such thing as a free lunch and they're not too happy about it. But they understand the bargain. Uh, they understand what the, the, the quid pro quo that needs to be put into place now. I am not fundamentally aware of what's happening in the Assumption Island base, whether that's been approved, the construction that's happening, whether that's hanging fire. But assuming that that deal will fall through, it makes Aglega all the more important uh, to have a sort of a strategic naval base uh, or strategic base for India and the Indian Ocean region because uh, a great game is being played out in the Iowa. The, the, the Chinese already have a, a, a base in uh, Djibouti. And and it's very important that India ramps up its presence uh, in this region to be able to protect its uh, uh, you know maritime interests, protect its trade routes uh, for anti piracy operations. And there's also obviously already a lot of ongoing sort of cooperation between the Indian Navy and uh, uh, Mauritius. Uh, 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 you know, Mauritius doesn't really have a navy, so there's already a lot of military cooperation. India routinely conducts anti-piracy operations, patrolling operations, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of goodwill established between these uh, countries in the region. So in that sense, I would say that uh, uh, the reality of Chagos is not going to change. Uh, the UK and the US is not going to abide by the UN's ruling. Uh, and, and Mauritius is going to just have to be happy that they have Chagos back on paper. But I don't really see Chagos being handed over to Mauritius in my lifetime. Uh, you know, I, I would be very surprised if that happened, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Yes, I think from all the points that uh, you've just stated, um, research and study of the Indian Ocean is going to be all the more important. And uh, I mean, because there's so much happening in the region, there's so much going on. I mean, just uh, if we look at last week, um, uh, India hosted the Indian Ocean Region Defense Minister's Conclave, and this was on the margins of um, Aero India 2021. Um, India's Defense Ministry, um, I, and I quote, uh, they said the broad theme of the conclave will be enhanced peace, security and cooperation in the Indian Ocean. And our Defense Minister, uh, Sri Rajnath Singh, um, he said um, India is ready to supply various types of missile systems, uh, guns, uh, tanks, radars, uh, electronic warfare systems and uh, other, wa other weapon systems to the Indian Ocean region countries. And he uh, specifically uh, emphasized that India... Uh, can be a net security provider uh, in the Indian Ocean region and is a reliable partner in the region. Um, so how is this viewed in Mauritius? And um, how do the Mauritians look at India as a credible partner when it comes to um, defense and security? See, uh, I feel in Mauritius does not really have external security threats. They don't have uh, territorial disputes with any country. Um, uh, the Mauritius's neighbors include uh, the island of Reunion, which is a district of France. It includes uh, the Seychelles Islands, which has a population of, uh, uh, I think, half or maybe even a fraction of what the Mauritian population is. Uh, there's Madagascar. And um, these islands don't really have militaries and they don't really have any sort of territorial or maritime disputes uh, that require. Mauritius to have a, a standing army or a navy or, a, or an air force. In fact, Mauritius does not have a, an army per se. It has more of a mobile reaction force uh, for any instances of terrorism, if at all. Right? In terms of uh, anti-piracy operations, it requires assistance in offshore patrolling when it comes to preventing drug smuggling. Uh, it requires assistance in sort of uh, protecting its reefs and uh, uh, what do you say, protecting its trade and so on and so forth. And that India and Mauritius, India is already a net security provider for Mauritius. In fact, some years back, we gifted the HMS, uh, uh, I think it's the Barracuda to, to Mauritius as a goodwill gesture. 
Now, I have seen that ship docked in Port Louis uh, since I've been coming here as a tourist, I think since 2014, end, uh, to present. And I've never really seen that ship uh, leave the waters, uh, you know, into the open ocean. Now, whether Mauritius is wholly reliant on India uh, for the offshore patrolling, but if you really think about it, I mean, just to digress, if you really, really think about it, um, whenever Mauritius has actually needed help, India has always been the first to answer, right? And this has been historically the case, whether it's the more recent MV Wakasho oil spill, or whether it's during the COVID-19 uh, out pandemic when, when the whole world was in lockdown, it was the Indian Navy and the Indian Air Force that actually flew in uh, 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 hydroxychloroquine and other life-saving drugs to Mauritius. They even sent in a team of doctors to Mauritius to help out when uh, the cases were piling up. So in that sense, India has always been a ready provider uh, of, of security, of humanitarian aid, of monetary aid. It's always been a reliable partner. And I don't really see Mauritius needing to uh, acquire missile systems or anti-aircraft batteries or drones because it really has no enemies, right? It has no external threat. It does have some homegrown radical extremism, uh, which which needs to be, I would say, handled. But this is more of a political problem rather than a, a military or a security problem. So uh, that having said, um, I think that Mauritius is is more important to India in terms of securing for itself a friendly Indian Ocean region country or a sort of a base from which India can safely uh, continue to be a net security provider for all the other countries in the region. I see it that way. Well, those were very, very key points that um, you brought out and you highlighted, uh, Mr. Tanvir, about all the different ways that India has um, helped and assisted M Mauritius. And I would say that this podcast would be incomplete if I didn't bring up the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And uh, in relation to that, my question to you is, as on 19th January 2021, India said it will send COVID-19 vaccines under the grant assistance to several countries, and this included Mauritius. So do you think India will be successful in eclipsing China's efforts to gaining long-term soft power with the Mauritians through vaccine diplomacy? Uh, could you share your views with us on that? I think this is where India has beaten China globally, right, through its Vaccine Maitri initiative. Um, because India is the vaccine manufacturer of the world, it is the pharmacy of the world. One in every three drugs sold to the US, sold in the US comes from India. Uh, I think it's generic drugs, yes, one in three generic drugs. And uh, obviously, uh, it, it, it would naturally make sense that India would take the lead in vaccine distribution. Now, India has already delivered 100,000 doses of uh, the Covishield uh, vaccine. And this was after a request from the Mauritian government. Uh, this is these hundred thousand doses will inoculate frontline workers, uh, military personnel, police, doctors, uh, important policy makers, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, what I've also read is that uh, Mauritius is sourcing another two hundred thousand doses from India by the end of March. Now, whether these two hundred thousand doses will come as a grant assistance or whether they will be paid for. Uh, is something I'm not exactly sure of. What Mauritius has also done is it's, a, it's applied officially for its vaccines to the COVAX Alliance. And what it said is, look, we're a small country. We're only 1.3 million people. Uh, we are COVID free. We do not have the political power or the purchasing power to, what do you, uh, to put ourselves ahead of the list or put ourselves ahead of the queue for vaccine procurement. So what we expect is about 20% of the vaccines to come from COVAX and then another 40%. To, sorry, the first tranche will, will cover about 20% of our population. That is the vaccines from COVAX. And the next tranche will be for the for about 40% of our population. And once we have about 60% of, of our population vaccinated, then we believe we have hit herd immunity levels. But obviously, it's going to take some time before COVAX delivers, right? And COVAX ultimately is a body that will uh, hand out vaccines based on who's donating. 
So COVAX could receive donations from Pfizer, from Moderna, from AstraZeneca, from Sputnik, from Sinopharm. So, but these vaccines, these Covishield vaccines, is a sort of a token of friendship between India and Mauritius. And in that sense, I believe that China cannot compare. It cannot. It does not stand a chance because India has moved very nimbly and in a very agile manner, not just to provide vaccines to Mauritius, but to a lot of other friendly neighboring nations, right? Myanmar, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, it's also supplied uh, commercially to Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Morocco, South Africa. It's it will soon come in supplies to Afghanistan. It's next supplying to the uh, it's supplied to Barbados. Um, it's 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 basically supplying to the world as of this point. And I think that not just with Mauritius, but from a global perspective, uh, India is all is winning and will continue to win the vaccine race and by default, build a lot of goodwill in that regard. And it's not just vaccines. As I mentioned earlier, India has supplied Remdesivir and HCQ and uh, teams of doctors to actually help out Mauritius during the height of the sort of uh, COVID-19 pandemic when the whole world was locked down. So in that sense, the goodwill has been go has gone back for a long time now. Well, sir, from all this information that you've just shared with us, I think it's safe to say that things are looking promising for India, um, uh, especially in this area of uh, vaccine diplomacy and uh, being the pharmacy of the world, as you said. Um, I think uh, COVID-19 hasn't really slowed India down or hasn't really stopped India from lending a hand to any country that needs help. So, um, sir, this brings me to my final question uh, for this C3S podcast. Um, so, since Mauritius is a highly multi-ethnic and um, a multilinguistic society, uh, we know that the vast majority of Mauritians uh, are descendants from Indians, while uh, minorities are, like you mentioned, uh, from African descent, Chinese descent, and even European descent. Um, so, in in your opinion, um, how should India leverage this umbilical link that it shares with uh, Mauritius to best suit its interests in countering China? Uh, please do share your thoughts on this, sir. Okay. So, uh, as you say, you're very correct. About 50% of the population in Mauritius of the 1.3 million people are identified as Hindu and originate from India. Another 27% identify as Christian. Uh, but again, there's a lot of ma intermarriage between the Hindu and the Catholic community here in Mauritius. So within this, uh, this sort of uh, Christian community, you still have a, a significant chunk of this uh, population subset that have Indian origins. Um, you then have about 18% who uh, practice Islam. And again, this population comes from India as well as it comes from Africa. And then you have your remainder, which is your Chinese, Mauritian, and your Buddhist, and your European expat, and so on and so forth. But obviously, because the majority of the population is Indian origin and have come from uh, Bihar and Tamil Nadu uh, 200 years ago, I think currently we're in fifth or sixth generation Mauritian. Uh, there are a lot of links. And, and some of the simplest cultural links are movies, right? I mean, Bollywood movies are enjoyed here. Tamil movies are enjoyed here. Most Mauritians speak Hindi, most Mauritians understand Hindi. My staff, my Mauritian staff who work with me, speak Hindi, understand Hindi very well. Um, uh, what you, the, the Hindi music, Bollywood music is supremely popular. It's played in concerts, it's played in malls, it's played in art exhibitions. In fact, singers are flown from India, classical singers, ghazal singers are flown from India for concert performances. Uh, Indian TV shows, especially your uh, K, K shows, you know, your Ekta Kapoor shows, your soap operas are, are, are in big demand here uh, in Mauritius. They are enjoyed. Uh, we may have outgrown them. We as Indians may have outgrown them towards Amazon and Netflix, but uh, they enjoy their sort of uh, Ekta Kapoor and their K dramas. And, and so they, these are the sort of soft linkages that actually bring Mauritius and uh, India together. And in fact, the, what the Mauritian government has done is it's provided huge incentives for Indian filmmakers to come and shoot here. Uh, whether you're shooting a film or a TV show, the incentive is if you come and shoot and you present your bills, your 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 bills subsidized by X percent, and that's why a lot of uh, uh, you know Indian films actually come here and shoot in Mauritius, and that actually boosts Mauritian tourism because when the movies 
uh, release in India, they say we like to thank the government of Mauritius, and then everybody's oh, okay. This was shot in Mauritius. Maybe let's go there on a holiday. So a simple cultural link is is films and movies and TV shows and music, right? Um, now bear in mind that while the Mauritian population, the Mauritian Hindu population is very proud of its links with India. They are very fond of India. They talk about India. They call it uh, uh, the Grand Peninsula. In, in Mauritius, uh, what you see India is referred to as La Grande Peninsula, which is the Grand Peninsula or the mother country. There's a lot of affection and reverence for it. They are firmly and fiercely Mauritians and they are very proud Mauritians. And there was actually this little uh, controversy that took place some weeks back. And this was... Uh, during an event hosted by the Mauritian Chamber of Commerce, the Mauritian Indian Chamber of Commerce, and uh, was uh, uh, attended by the outgoing Indian High Commissioner, a gentleman named Tanmay Lal. And one of the attendees, uh, Mauritian, stood up and said, you know, uh, we take great uh, offense when Mauritius is referred to as Chota Bharat. I mean, we are not Chota Bharat. And Mr. Tanmay Lal, who does not mince his words, or is a man not known to mince his words, said very clearly that, look, no Indian ever refers to Mauritius as Chota Bharat. I don't refer to it as Chota Bharat. No Indian I know has ever referred to Mauritius as Chota Bharat. It is only you Mauritians that refer to Mauritius as Chota Bharat. And you seem to get offended by your own, uh, uh, what do you say, terminology. And, and on balance, I would agree with Mr. Lal because uh, I have seen a lot of Mauritians use that term. Uh, so what, what does this infer? It infers that while there is a lot of strong linkages, uh, cultural linkages between the two countries, Mauritians are still very fiercely proud of their identity, as the, of their Mauritian identity. Uh, a lot of Mauritians, what they also do is because they are descendants of Indians, they go in for uh, the, the OCI cards. Why do they go in for their OCI cards? Because they all dream of actually owning property in India. They have dreams of opening bank accounts in India, spending time in India, the way that any Indian would say, you know what, once I retire, I'm going to spend six months a year in the UK or six months a year in the US. Or They enjoy going to India. They enjoy going on tour. They enjoy living in their homes, their properties. And uh, which is why there's a huge demand among Mauritians for the OCI card that allows them to actually buy property and open up bank accounts. And I think another huge cultural linkage is, uh, what do you say, religious tourism. And this is especially the case in Tamil Nadu, because a lot of Mauritians like to come to Tamil Nadu. They like to come and do the temple tours. Uh, they take their religion, Hindu religion, very, very seriously. They take their religion, I would say, far more seriously than most Indians that I know. And there's a lot of Mauritian demand for tourism in Haridwar and a lot of uh, Vaishno Devi. And uh, in fact, uh, a lot of Mauritians, Mauritians spend a lot of money coming to India flying all over the country, visiting the top temples from north to the south of Tirupati to from Tamil Nadu to Vaishnava Devi to Haridwar to all of these temples, right? So th there's a huge amount of uh, temple and religious linkages. And as I mentioned earlier in this podcast, the RSS of the uh, uh, Hindu sort of organizations have actually helped build temples and, and prayer halls and, um, and so on and so forth in Mauritius. Another huge area of synergy is medical tourism. Mauritius is very heavily dependent on India in, in medical tourism. Um, uh, patients routinely fly to the flight. The Air Mauritius Bangalore Chennai flight is called the medical flight. I've taken that flight, uh, uh, I don't know, 100 times in my life. And there are at least 10, 15, 20 patients flying to Bangalore and Chennai treatment. And there are about 10, 15, 20 patients flying back to Mauritius after treatment. Uh, and even now, while the borders are still shut and in the DGCA in India has closed the Indian borders, uh, Mauritius is still flying uh, uh, flights with patients, sick patients to India for treatment. There are patients flying as we speak because Mauritius still relies heavily on, uh, on India for tertiary care. And India generally provides a better quality of care, better health outcomes for a fraction of the price which is why Mauritians still prefer to travel to India despite COVID being there in India to receive treatments. Um, um, so that itself is a huge thing. So there are obviously these huge sort of cultural linkages that exist between India and Mauritius that is absolutely not present uh, between China and Mauritius. Because again, the Chinese or, uh, uh, origin population in Mauritius is a fraction of a percentage. And so these links very clearly do, do not exist as 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 uh, the links do between India and Mauritius. Uh, now, 
lastly, I'll, I'll speak a bit about rumor and conjecture here. And again, all of this is to be taken, uh, uh, what do you say, as, as simple rumor and, and political mudslinging. See, the current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Jagannath, is perceived to be very close to Modi. In fact, his uh, detractors continue to refer to him as a Modi stooge. And, uh, um, and because he's so close to Modi, he controls the uh, Hindu vote in Mauritius. And there are even rumors that his elections have been bankrolled by Modi. And there was this very strong rumor, this very, very, very strong rumor going up out in November that uh, uh, his daughter, that is Jagannath's younger daughter, was, maddy, was marrying one of uh, Modi's nephew's sons. And uh, some of the luxury hotels in Mauritius were being prepared for extended quarantines of this huge Bharat coming from India. And then the, the, the Prime Minister Jagannath actually had to come in and deny the rumor and said, no such thing is happening. Uh, this is absolutely false. But the rumor still stays, right? In fact, uh, when one of the local uh, channels, uh, radio channels, Top of FM, uh, criticized Modi and criticized Jagannath and Modi, the Prime Minister Jagannath actually had Top of FM shut down, prevented it from broadcasting. Top of him had to go to the Supreme Court, get an injunction, and then start uh, broadcasting again. So there is a lot of bond homie between the two leaders. There is a lot of talk that these two leaders are joined at the hip and are very, very close. And um, as a slur, uh, Jagannath is referred to as a Chota Modi or a Modi stooge or a Modi Bhakt or an RSS Bhakt. And this is what his political opponents and his detractors continue to throw at him. Um, and there is, yes, uh, in instances of Mauritius slowly adopting the authoritarian playbook. In fact, there is a, a minister here who's on trial. I'm not going to go to why he's on trial. But uh, when there were protests outside the courthouse, the government actually deployed armed snipers on the roof. And that was a huge controversy because Mauritius is a very peaceful country. The protesters were unarmed. So why deploy armed snipers. So there was a bit of authoritarianism creeping in. So people are saying that, oh, Prime Minister Jagannath is playing by the Modi playbook, right? He's crushing dissent of any kind. So there is a lot of talk. There's a lot of rumor. There's a lot of mudslinging. Uh, all of this has to be taken with a huge bag of salt. But, uh, you know, this shows that the links, not just between the two countries, but between the politicians also are very, very close. And it is these links, uh, cultural, economic, political, that will ensure that Mauritius remains a more naturally aligned partner towards India. So this is signing the FTA is not something to be really alarmed about. If you consider the sort of linkages and the help that India has extended to Mauritius recently and over the course of the last several years, um, um, there is nothing to really be alarmed about. But again, one shouldn't be complacent, right? You have to keep working with your allies and your partners in the region. You have to keep building and nurturing these relationships. And more importantly, with Mauritius, it needs India needs to walk a fine line. It needs to continue assisting. It needs to continue getting what it needs to get out of the relationship, but without too much overreach. Because once over, because the Mauritian population is fiercely proud of their identity, and uh, they will feel snubbed or offended if they feel that uh, they are doing it, they are doing what they are doing because they don't seem to have a choice. Um, so that, uh, what do you say, concludes my answer to this particular question. And I hope I was able to sort of uh, he help the audience understand in, the, in, in this regard how very close these two countries are. Well, Mr. Tanvir, those are all the questions that I have for you today for this C3S podcast on the topic Island Diplomacy, India's Engagements with Mauritius and the China Factor. Thank you so much for answering all my questions so comprehensively. And um, I think the layman's perception of Mauritius um, has always been lagoons and beaches and um, basically a tourist destination that we all want to check off our bucket list. Um, so after listening to everything that you just shared, all the points that you brought out, I think um, you've piqued our interest in the island uh, so much more. I mean, I for one, I found your points to be very, very enlightening. And I'm sure that all our listeners have benefited greatly from all the responses that you had for the questions that I had posed to you. Uh, sir, on behalf of uh, Team C3S, I sincerely thank you for readily agreeing to participate in the C3S podcast and for taking time out to connect with us all the way from Mauritius. Thank you so much, sir, for doing this with us today.
thank you so much for having me aishwarya and mauritius is also beautiful beaches and lagoons some of the mm-hmm. most beautiful beaches and lagoons in the world so i would encourage uh, anybody who once of course the vaccine is rolled out and mauritius lifts its borders to come and visit and what mauritius is also offering is a, uh, a long term remote working visa so if you can prove that you can work remotely mauritius will be happy to give you a visa for a year extendable by another year because it wants to come and stay it wants you to come and spend here so uh, india anybody really are most welcome to come here spend some time here get to know the people get to know the culture it's a beautiful country it captured my heart the, more, the first time i came here to 14 i've been living here for the past 4 years no plans on moving anywhere else uh, and uh, very delighted to be able to speak uh, to you today to sort of better help you understand this beautiful island that that i've come to call home and uh, yes thank you so much for having me thank you thank you very much sir for your kind words as we come to the end of the c3s podcast on the topic island diplomacy india's engagements with mauritius and the china factor i sincerely thank commodore rs vasan indian navy retired director c3s for giving me this opportunity to interview mr tanveer jay kishan today I also place on record my thanks to the esteemed members of C3S for their unfailing support and active contributions. I thank the team C3S, Mr. C Balasubramanian and Ms. Shivani Sundar for all the efforts made by them towards making this podcast a success. And last but not the least, I thank all those who are listening to this podcast from far and wide, and I sincerely hope that each of you will continue to support the C3S podcast initiative in the days to come. Until next time, this is Aishwarya S. Menon, Research Officer at the Chennai Centre for China Studies, signing off. If you liked this podcast and are interested in more of our content, please do check out our C3S YouTube channel and our official C3S website. Thank you.